Welcome to episode 41 of Chew on This, a Nerds United podcast. I'm BJ. Vic. So not not too long ago, over the summer, uh, I don't know if you guys are under a rock or not, but we watched this little show on Netflix called Stranger Things. And I, and I was kind of like watching that, I kind of like brought me back to my childhood, to the 80s and all that stuff. And it made me feel like very like nostalgic. And I could tell like by watching that show that the people that, as the Duffer Brothers, they were pretty heavily influenced by... Um, some movies in the eighties, you know, specifically like Goonies and Stand by Me, and probably the X Files show in the nineties. I don't know. There, it was a lot of influences, so it got us kind of thinking about, like, you know, what t- what influential movies like or what movies in the eighties influenced us as well. So that was kind of an interesting conversation. But we decided not to talk about it and just to reveal our our lists tonight. So. Um, you want me to go first? Yeah, so these are our top 10 most influential 80s movies to us. So that means it, if it's inf- it, it's influential to us in the sense that like it's something that not just, I would say, maybe changed the way we think of things or um, or maybe how we felt about things. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe it's the first time you saw a tit in a movie or something <laughs> or, the, or, or sometimes you it's like you know some anything like that so that's that's what it means so it's not so it's not about the top 10 best movies of the 80s or the top 10 like you know it, it's it's personal to us so yes. these are our top 10 80s 80 most influential 80s movies to us and feel free to comment um you know, through through Facebook or through Twitter, when when after we release the podcast and you hear it, and maybe you think you know, share your share our, one of your top tens or share your list as well. So that'd be kind of fun too. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, we participate. Yeah, on Twitter we're at you on this pod, so it'd be really easy to to tweet uh, maybe your list or what you thought of our list. Um, you're right; these are definitely movies that were influential to us in some one way or another. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just how what, what how we felt about it. And I it, this was really hard. I don't know if it was for you, but like I was looking, it was a daunting list. And I finally just said, you know, I'm not even going to look at the movies that came out in the 80s. I just went off of what I remember. And so I was able to narrow it down to 10. I do have like five on the outskirts. I'm sure there's a lot more if I looked at the list from the 80s, but... I just kind of came up with, you know, off the top of my head, and then and then I kind of adjusted it and what position I would put it in. So, um, all right. So I'm going to go off my list first. Um, so we're going to go from 10 to 1. So number 10, the most influential 80s movie for me uh, would be Ghostbusters. Also, uh, after we go through our list, we're going to, you know, go into a discussion about these movies. So I'm just going to plow through these. Um, so number 10 is Ghostbusters. Uh, number nine, Willow. Uh, number eight, Terminator, the first one. I think the second one came out in 91, so I wouldn't count, but Terminator 1. Uh, seven would be Blade Runner. Uh, number six would be uh, Wrath of Khan. Star Trek Wrath of Khan, so that's the second Star Trek. Number five would be Back to the Future. Four, uh, Goonies. Number three, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Number two, E.T., and number one, everyone can probably out there guess because I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, Empire Strikes Back. Um, and- okay. We we uh, we have a few that are the same. Um, and anyway, you'll hear what after I go through my top ten. Okay, cool. So here's my top ten. All right. So number ten for me, number ten for me is Willow. Number nine, Transformers the movie. Number eight, Batman. That's the Tim Burton first one. Uh, number seven is Ghostbusters. Six is Back to the Future. Five is Empire Strikes Back. Four is The Karate Kid. Three is Return of the Jedi. Two is E.T. And number one for me is Goonies. Wow. Yeah, we, we had some, yeah. I mean, pretty pretty close ones there, but you had a lot of interesting ones in there that I never thought of. Um, yeah, what, um, well, why don't you go through... Uh, why don't you go through yours first, and I'll try to explain mine too, because mine has, you know, again, it's it's personal to me. So, well, um, and 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 you can you can different. yeah, and as I'm talking, I mean, you can go into to the, you've seen all these movies too, and I'm sure you love these movies just as much as I do. But you know, we can talk both about it. But um, Ghostbusters, I mean, 
for me, it was like just this um, crazy, like I, I loved SNL when I was a kid. And so to see, you know, Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd up there fighting ghosts, um, Harold Ramis. I mean, I love Stripes. Um, of course, I was really young to be watching that, but it didn't matter. I still watched it. And so that funny, that movie to me is one of the most perfectly made movies out there. Like there's really nothing about it that I can nitpick or say like, this is awful. It's everything about it is so enjoyable still to this day. I mean, we live tweeted it last month before we saw the, the Ghostbusters movie, the, the reboot, uh, far less superior one. Um, so Ghostbusters to me is like a near perfect film. Just one of those films that's near perfect. Um, and you had Ghostbusters on your list as well, right? Yeah, I had it much higher. I had it at number seven. Okay, so what, for you, what was Ghostbusters for you? I mean, I just remember, for me, it was just, I remember, you know, this, that ghosts weren't always scary, kind of. I mean, there were some there were some <laughs> scary moments in there or some jump moments in there, but I just remember that movie, like, there's... For a comedy especially, if you can walk out of a comedy and you basically quote every single line and you can use it in everyday life, like, or if you, you know, 20-something years later, 30-something years later, somebody says something to you and you can reference the movie, like, that to me um, is big. So there's not one time where somebody says, like, you know, if you're going to order pizza, you know, who do you want to call or something referencing right. to that, like close to it? You don't there's no there's no part of me that doesn't think about Ghostbusters. Yeah, it's it's in um, our it's in our lexicon, man. It's it's in our DNA. It's right. Yeah. Good. Um, so number nine, uh, I said Willow and Willow for me. I think I was a pretty, pretty well into my teens when that movie came out and um I don't know. There's something about that movie. Like, you know, Willow was like, I mean, they're, they're, they're little people and, uh, they overcome these like huge odds and stuff like that. And I think when I was a teenager, I was kind of awkward and nerdy and stuff like that. And so like that movie kind of helped me kind of like get out of my shell a little bit. I know it sounds weird, but like just, he was like this little person who goes on this extraordinary adventure and becomes like a man in the process essentially like becomes more, of a man and more like brave and, and, um, takes care of his family, takes care of his village. And then he ultimately becomes what he always desires. And that was to be a wizard. And he had it inside of him the entire time. Um, and it was, it was really, I mean, that movie still holds up today too. I mean, yeah, there's cheesy special effects, but that's not the point. Like the point is just the story is a really good story. And I also read somewhere, um, I guess they have a sequel to it because they have, they're in books. I heard there was a sequel to it. I was always bummed that they never made the sequel, but I guess looking back now, it didn't make a lot of money. I think Ron Howard directed it, and I've heard through like reading things that he really didn't direct it. Like George Lucas pretty much called all the shots, and Ron Howard was just kind of there, <laughs> you know. And um, but that movie I think still holds up. Val Kilmer is amazing in it. Like when they when he kept saying like he was this great swordsman and like will is like you haven't showed me shit yet dude and then when he finally like shows that he is a warrior it was like really cool scene and um you know i know we make fun of like uh, uh certain aspects of willow like in other movies like warcraft and stuff like that but it's another movie that i reference quite a bit um at least in my adulthood i've, I've referenced that movie a lot um what about you? What uh, Willow was uh, number ten for you? Yeah, number ten. Um, so not too far off from you. Um, to me, I just remember uh, I I watched it. I didn't watch it in theater. I think I was. I don't remember how old I was when I saw it in at home. It actually just came out on VHS tape. My dad rented it from a local video store that wasn't Blockbuster, <laughs> and um, I just remember. Um, just being in awe uh, of it because there's like a there's there's a there's an overlaying theme to my top 10 and, and it's about adventure and, and fantasy mm -hmm. um and growing up like that, that's what that those are the movies i love the most or, or that i could just get lost in and, and thought it would be so cool to be part of that world um well maybe not except for like empire strikes back i don't want my hand getting cut off but, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but something about willow just like everything the magic the sword fighting the adventure uh the magic just was 
everything that I could want in a film. And I don't think it actually is rated very high on Rotten Tomatoes based on like the, you know, again, back then, um, there weren't a lot of reviews as much as there are now. No. So, so you, you all you basically got were the newspaper clippings and the major movie critics that rated the movie. So it didn't, it didn't rate very high back then. Um, but I, you know, maybe if I look back on it now, it there's there could be flaws in the movie, but I I can't get over the nostalgia factor. Yeah, I can't either. And I think I mean, I don't know. Like I, I it's been a couple of years since I've seen it, but I remember when I watched it a couple of years ago with my son because we've been going through all these '80s movies here and there. I'll show him when he gets certain ages. I show him stuff, and I showed him that movie, and he was really. I got the reaction I was hoping for. He was really just excited about it. And and then I thought to myself, damn, they don't really make movies like that anymore. There was a the, like a long period of time in the '80s where they made stuff like Beastmaster. You know, we talked about that before, and like um, those like sci-fi fantasy type, you know, wizards and warriors type movies. And they don't really make those. And then like we have Harry Potter and we have Lord of the Rings, you know, and stuff like that. But it's not the same. <laughs> it's not it's not the same thing. But um, well, it's too much of a risk. I mean, when you it get- is. You know your your tentpole movies now are comic book movies, or books that have been successful. I think Willow was an original story by George Lucas. Yeah. So yeah, you know if you, if you think about that movie being made now, it would be like in the hundred and fifty million dollar range to make that movie now. Right. And it has no basis of any fandom or anything to go to. Studios are just scared to make movies like that. I didn't have any like really movie stars in it either. I mean Val Kilmer had started in a couple of things by then and um yeah there wasn't really anybody big there yeah in in that one yeah so um number eight i was surprised that you had well let's let's go through let's go through uh surprises right now in the lists i the the movies that you had on your list that i didn't were terminator blade runner star trek 2 and raiders of the lost ark so right in the middle of your list you differ Right, me, and you go heavily sci-fi with Terminator or Blade Runner. I I I would Khan almost I would almost have to say it's probably age because I was older than you. So like I was able to see things in the theater that you probably weren't able to. So I have a huge react. Like I saw Empire in the theater. I saw every single Star Wars movie ever made in the theater, and um, I remember Empire so well. I don't know if I should shoot all the way to the beginning of my list. Should I? Um, well, I mean, what doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. So, so empire strikes back for me. I was, I was seven years old. I got to stand in those long lines for like four hours long. I was just a kid and my uncle and his girlfriend at the time were like, like, you know, um, entertaining me the whole time. I mean, that was, it was a long time to be standing out in the sun and I'm and seven and being seven years old. But I did it. And then I remember going in the theater. And in L.A., this theater that we went into probably housed like 1,200 people. It's not like a 200 people or 100-person theater. It's huge. So we got in there. And when that thing sucker started up, it was just, it blew me away. And then, you know, when they baked that big reveal with Darth Vader, I remember almost crying. I was so upset. I was like, how could this be? You know, I'd, but but at the same time going like, I remember even at seven years old, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's such a cool twist like I can't wait to see what happens in the next movie you know like oh no like Luke is gonna have to fight him or defeat him or something you know so it was it was a huge I mean it that was the hugest thing I mean like you know bigger than like you know I don't know I I can't I can't think of any kind of comparisons except for maybe like JR getting shot on Dallas, you know, in the eighties. And like, you know, that was, that was a pretty freaking big deal too. I remember my parents like in just in shock and like all summer long talking about, Oh my God, who shot JR? You know? And that was a big deal. Um, but it, it was huge. Um, and I just remember having these goosebumps and I also remember being afraid of that movie for a long time. Like we Return of the Jedi came out. It was more like lighthearted and stuff, even though the emperor stuff was a little deep in the end, but the movie as a whole was kind of lighter and um, funnier with the Ewoks and all that BS. But empire is like bleak, you know, pretty, pretty bleak all the way through. There's some moments where you're like, you catch a breath and, but it was, that's a relentless movie. I mean, there's, and it has everything. It's got, action adventure it's got romance it's got sadness it's got happy you know there's 
all sorts of things going on in that movie. It's like one of the most flawless movies out there. It's like it's like a, it's like the Godfather two of Star Wars. You know, it's just it's such a good, you know, um, sequel or middle movie that it was really hard. Like when Return of the Jedi came out, you know, obviously I love that movie so much, but like as an adult now, I really appreciate Empire more. Um, what about Empire for you? So you had, for that was on your for list. me. I had. For me, I had Empire rated lower than Jedi, and the movies that I have on my list that you don't are Transformers the movie, Batman, um, I think Back to the Future, right? Yeah, Back to the Future, Mm -hmm. uh, and Return of the Jedi, and The Karate Kid. Um, So, yeah, there's an age difference, because, let's see, the only movie out of all of these that I remember seeing in the theater were... Actually, I don't remember seeing any of these in the theater. Oh, no, wait, Batman. Even though I went to go see E.T., I don't remember E.T. I've said this many yeah. times on the podcast Yeah, that my dad took me to see E.T., but I remember seeing Batman, um, and it's in a theater that's closed down now in New Jersey, but it, I remember that movie and being completely in awe of Batman, and that was like the first movie or first... Like, I always watched the Batman 66. Yeah. But even then, I knew, like, it was, like, kind of, like, not badass, you know? Hokey, I mean, yeah. Right, so... But when I watched Tim Burton's Batman, and I know a lot of teenagers and people who were older than me that were reading comic books for a really long time had a problem with that movie, but for me, I didn't have that background at that point in time. I didn't have comic books. I mean, I knew Batman, but I didn't really read comics. Batman was my first... The Tim Burton Batman was my first foray into like, oh my god, Batman can be a badass and not dance around and do the Batusi. <laughs> so that was like huge for me. The other movie for me that is not on your list is um, Transformers the movie, and that was major for me because that was like the first movie that I ever saw that I almost lost. Like I feel like it, um, I kind of lost my innocence in that movie, mm-hmm. and it's because they decided to kill Optimus Prime, and for me growing up or for any kid growing up, it would be like if they decided to kill like strawberry shortcake or something like that, or <laughs> you know, like that, that, like it's the, I mean, it's the main good guy. And like, think about that for a second. Like if you were watching empire strikes back and they decided to kill Luke halfway through, like you just didn't do that back then. Right. You know, um, it's not like the walking dead now or, or Game of Thrones, where fucking main characters are just killed left and right. And, and this is a cartoon we're talking about. Like, I grew up watching the original Transformers, G1, Generation 1. And that was, you know, from 84 to 85. That's the and only way the to go. Came out, it's the only way the, to go. And the movie came out in that time frame. And he, when he died, I was like, wait a minute, Optimus Prime can't die. He's like the main person in the entire, like, toy line basically or the, the the whole show so that was big for me back to the future was big because i didn't see it in the theater but like i love time travel movies so yes. that to me was just amazing to be able to go back in time and, and do a time like be in a time machine that was a car that i at that point in time knew nothing about the karate kid was huge for me and my sister i remember because we again saw it on vhs tape and i remember like you know, the that was my first movie that I've ever seen anybody get bullied and the 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 kid getting bullied fights back. That was the first time I yeah, re- ever remember seeing a movie like that. That's a good point. I think that's for me too. I remember um I saw that movie in the theater as well, and I remember the first half of it is just so bleak. You're like, Oh my god, I feel so bad for this kid, you know, and he tries, you know, and he and he keeps getting the crap beat out of him. And then that you know, his gardener, the the landlord, like helps him, you know, learn to defend himself. Was the, he's the maintenance guy. The maintenance so guy, yeah. The, so what I have to explain is why Jedi is higher than Empire for me and why it's not in my top two, even though Star Wars is a big influence now for me. The reason why is because, unlike you, I saw no Star Wars in the theater. The very first Star Wars that I ever saw was, uh, was A New Hope, the special edition in theaters. That was the first time oh, I ever wow. saw Star Wars in, 90s, in, in the movie in 1997. Theater. Yeah. So for me, I always watched Star Wars either on tape, HBO, or Laserdisc. That's the only time that I'd ever watched Star Wars. 
And by that time, I had watched Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi so many times as a kid. I didn't understand the the impact of you know I'm your father. Mm-hmm. I didn't I, I didn't get the impact. So by that time, it had already become pop culture. So for me, growing up, when I was watching Star Wars, Jedi was the one that stood out the most to me because um, it was the good guy finally winning. Empire was influential to me because it was the first time a movie ever ended where the bad guys won. And yeah. I was like, wait a minute, where are you going? Why are you leaving Luke behind on the on the medical brigade? Like, uh, forget he's he just got his new hand. Let's go. <laughs> let's go get Han. Go get Han. The movie can't end now. Yeah, the movie can't end now. So like. So, but Jedi is hired to me because as a kid, you know, the good guys won. Luke becomes a Jedi Knight finally, becomes a Jedi, saves his father, you know, defeats the Emperor. That was like the, the, the you know, the it's pretty big storybook Hollywood ending that you would get for a kid. It wasn't until I got older and I started like really analyzing all three films that Empire became my favorite. But if we're just talking like straight 80s, like growing Influential, up. Influential, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you real Jedi, uh, you, Jedi ranks high. You realize if you were born like 15 years later, your the first movie you'd watch would be Episode One in the theater, and you'd be like, that yeah, would be your go-to yeah. movie, and I would just be like, I'm not your friend. <laughs> like, <laughs> Jar Jar was so influential. I'm like, oh, Misa, yeah. Misa gonna kill you. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I had, um, um, so I had Terminator, and Terminator for me. Um, Again, I was probably 10 or 11. I didn't really see a lot of rated R movies back then, but like that was one of the first ones. And um, that movie just blew me away because it scared the shit out of me when he just like opened the door. He's all Sarah Connor and she's like, yes. And he just blows her away. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, why are you doing that? And then, you know, and then, of course, the whole time travel aspect was cool. And, um, and the fact that uh, Kyle Reese ends up being the father. And so, like, it was really, like, I was 10-year-old just, like, fascinated by that. I'm like, wait a minute. He went back in time and impregnated her to make John Carter? I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I'm like, <laughs> um, so, no, I mean, but there's so many aspects of that movie. I mean, that's where I'll Be Back was born. And we've heard that incessantly. It's probably the most quoted uh, line in the history of cinema. Probably the most well known, anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, that movie to me, I mean, every time I see it, it just makes me giggle. And there's so many problems with that movie. It's so schlocky and cheesy. I mean, the special effects and all that stuff. But it's still like I don't know. I still love it when I whenever it comes on. And Terminator Two, you know, if that was in the '80s, that would have been. Like if we ever do a '90s influential, that that would be the first one on my list because that was a huge influence to me. Uh, that second Terminator. That was the first movie I think I ever saw in the theater more than two times. Yeah, I went, like, so I saw it like that was one the of the top five movie experiences I've ever had. It, it's in there. It 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 was that was huge. Uh, I went there opening night with the audience. That was amazing, and there was clapping and cheering through the whole thing. I mean, it was just so fucking awesome. It's like being at a rock rock I, uh, concert. I had I had Terminator on my list, but I took it off. Okay. Um, because of it, it just like I, I loved. I still love the movie, but it just it didn't it didn't fit anywhere in like things that were big to me. Like Batman for again, Batman was that summer that Batman came out. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere without a bat insignia somewhere. Yeah. Like the bat logo was everywhere that summer. Um, I mean, we, we, the only one we had together that was the same was ET. We both had it at number two. Yes. Um, I mean, we've talked, I've talked about ET, uh, plenty of times. Your number one was empire. And I completely understand why that's there. You had Goonies at four. I had Goonies at one. That was really Uh, tough because see 1985 was such an awesome movie uh, year for movies because a lot of like the Goonies and back to the future, I think both came out right around then. And so that one was really tough for me. The the reason why Goonies won out over back to the future just by one is the mere fact that again, it's that sense of adventure. Like you were talking about, like I watched that movie so many times and I still, and I loved it. I just love the authenticity of the kids. They were, you know, always yelling and talking over each other. And I'm like, yeah, that's me and my friends. I mean, it just didn't seem like it was script, scripted. It just, they were just kids being kids. And I think that's why we love Stranger Things so much because Goonies really, I mean, it captured that Goonies feeling, you know, that, that um, sense of adventure and whatnot. 
But um, yeah, it's really hard to get childhood child actors that know how to act. Yeah, they did I it. Mean, they did it good in Super Eight. We talked about that. And Stranger Things, I mean, I thought the kids were great. I mean, they they picked some really cool kids, you know. And uh, but Goonies, I mean, a lot of those guys are pretty well known now um, after all these years. But that group of kids just did it's just such an awesome job that I I wanted to be with them. I wanted to hang out with them. I even like took a trip I, many many years later, you know, an adult driving around. I actually took a trip up to Astoria and went to the Goonies, actual Goonies house. And that just gave me shivers. I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is where chunk did the truffle shuffle right here outside this gate. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, if I wasn't a chicken shit, I would have gone out there and done it. I'm sure a lot of people have, um, uh, it's my number one because it's the, for me, it was the ultimate adventure movie growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> they were about the same age or a little bit older than I was when I, when I watched the movie, and I remember trying to actually have a Goonie adventure <laughs> in like the park or something like just going to the park or somewhere with my friends on bikes and just trying to have a Goonie adventure. Like I remember going through like a, a concrete factory, like kind of trying to see like if there was like any buried treasure and outside the concrete factory. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but there was no. Dude, there if, was you, the if you if... although I did find a case of beer one time. <laughs> <laughs> if you went into like a park bathroom looking for one eyed Willie, I'd be really worried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's that's why Goonies is my number one most influential. Do you, do you know that I watched it even in college? I, I mean, I still watch oh it today gosh. and I'm like holding off to show it to my kids um, because there's like adult themes in there. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I the same thing with Star Wars. Like I, I remember. Like I just said about Empire, like it didn't have an impact on me um, because, you know, it become pop culture by that point in time. Like I'm actually holding back all of the Star Wars movies mm-hmm. before I can show my girls just to see like when when they get older, I want them to to actually pay attention and have the impact. Like I want them like I was robbed of the I'm your father. Right. I want them to have what I couldn't have. That was the ultimate um, robbery. Oh, man. <laughs> I think people. Are... I mean, I was I was robbed because I was just watching it all the time. I just watched it at a very young age. You know? Yeah, and yeah, you, and I had the same thing too. Like I could never watch the scene where Luke got his hand cut off after I saw it. Like for years, I couldn't watch it. That um, well, that that brings me to Raiders of the Lost Ark because there's a scene in that where the face gets melted off. I mean, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like seven, eight years old when that movie came out, and my parents took me to see it, and I. I love that movie all the way through until the guy's face melted off and I started crying <laughs> and they had to like, I, I think I don't even remember. I think we left the theater early after that happened. I don't think I got to see the ending until way later, but it was, yeah, it was, uh, it, that was parents were those assholes who brought a fucking kid. Yeah. But that was but, too young, but I was a kid that didn't make a beep. I mean, they took me to the movies for, since I was really little, but, that movie, like right at the end, I started crying. I'm like, I care, you know. And they're like, it's yeah, because right. you're fucking seven years old. <laughs> like you shouldn't be taking a kid to a movie like that. I remember going to see the first X Men opening night, the very first X Men, and then when Wolverine's claws come out, everybody like cheered, and then all of a sudden you hear this fucking baby crying. And I'm like, who the fuck brought a baby to X Men? Oh man, I'll do you one better. Yeah, that's that's anytime you take a baby anywhere, it's not. I mean, to movies, it's not <laughs> not a good idea, obviously, but. I went to see Saving Private Ryan, and this couple came in with two young kids and sat down in front of oh us. God. And I was like, I, I leaned over and I was like, are you sure you want to be bringing your kids to this? I've heard it's like really, really like the first 20 minutes are really brutal. Like that's what I've heard. Yeah. Borderline pornographic, you know, the way the stuff was portrayed. And like they um, pornographic and, and like violence, what I meant, what I mean by that. Um and sure enough, I mean, 15 minutes into 10 minutes in the sequence, they were crying hard and they got up and left. And I was like, you idiots, you know, <laughs> but uh, uh, gosh, what somebody a- brought a seven year old to the Matrix Reloaded. No, oh, no, that's not- and it was explained because like if you remember it, it, there's like a tonal shift in the Matrix and the Matrix Reloaded. Yes. Where there's just like a shit ton of dialogue and Reloaded that is very fast and very like, I don't know psychological or societal type Mm -hmm. conversation going on and i remember that going on and then the kid didn't understand what was going on 
And instead of the parents saying, just be quiet and listen. They explained it to them. Yeah, and I'm Dear like, are you God. fucking kidding me? It's a rated R movie. What the fuck are you doing? That's just bad parenting. Yeah. Just go home and smoke crack with the kid or something. Uh, <laughs> You're teaching your kid to be an asshole. That's not not a not a good <laughs> not a good thing. Um so yeah. the other one I had was uh that you didn't have was Blade Runner. And again, it's one of man, I had Harrison Ford in here like three times. But um <laughs> Blade Runner was one of these weird, like, I mean, now it's a cult classic, but I remember I was one of the few guys that watched it when I was very, very young, again, like seven or eight years old, and ended up, more and more I watched that movie, the more I appreciated it, and the more I was like, wow, because the way that thing was filmed, it should not have been able to be filmed that way in the 80s. It still looks good today when you watch it. It still looks unbelievable. In fact, they've, like, remastered it in Blu-ray and all that stuff, but... I was just blown away by how that thing was filmed and how deep the story was and how deep the characters were. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, director, the, what they went back and did the Harrison Ford, uh, dialogue, you know, over the film, which when you listen to it, you could tell Harrison Ford was pissed that he had to do that, do the voiceovers. (laughs) Oh, totally. He just does. He sounds like he's phoning it in from his bathroom or something like that, taking a dump. He just didn't care. And, so I prefer the the version that the director's cut that doesn't have the voiceovers at all. And that way, when you watch it, you determine for yourself whether you believe he's a replicant or not or, you know, all the other the stuff that's going on in there. And I really like that. So Blade Runner for me, I mean, over time has even gotten better. So and I'm I guess they announced that they're making a sequel. It comes out next October or something like that. So yeah, that'll be interesting. I think, Jer- I think actually Jared Leto is rumored to be in it now. Oh, okay, good. Get away from the DCU and start doing something worthy. So it's not. It didn't even crack my top twenty Blade Runner, and, and the major reason for that is is age. It really is because I remember watching that movie and thinking, "What the fuck am I watching?" <laughs> it's like, it's I was weird. Too young to yeah to get it to get it yeah it's um. It's a weird. Yeah, there's a lot of movies like that. I remember there was. Uh, I remember like watching a lot of movies growing up in the '80s. Like there's a there's so many great '80s movies, but like uh, this this somehow okay. So Blade Runner, Empire Strikes Back, and Revenge of the Nerds all have something in common for me. Things that I didn't get. <laughs> yeah, and I said Revenge of the Nerds, and and here's how I'll link Revenge of the Nerds in there. So <clears throat> I said that Empire didn't have a big impact on me because I just didn't get the I am your father thing. Like I didn't just it didn't hit, it didn't dawn on me right? right when I first watched it. And then again, by the time I understood what was going on, it was already part of pop culture. So I didn't understand. It didn't have a big impact. Blade Runner I watched. And like if you show like a seven year old that movie, they're just not going to get it. It's 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 a complicated movie even for an adult sometimes to get. Yeah. Or theme like underlying themes in there. So how Revenge of the Nerds <laughs> links into that? That's so weird. Is I remember, <laughs> yeah. Wait till I explain it. I remember there's a scene in Revenge of the Nerds, and again, I watched it. You know, young. I don't remember how young, but I remember watching it like on HBO or something. I remember watching it, and there's a scene where the nerds are uh, trying to get into the the uh, uh, Alpha Betas. I think they were called uh, the and the sorority. No, no, the fraternity. The fraternity. Sororities okay. Chicks. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. No, they're trying to pledge. They're trying to pledge. pledge okay. The fraternity. Gotcha. So, there's a scene when the nerds get in, and they're pledging or going through these, you know, hazes, hazing, and they're in the. They get tarred and feathered basically, and then all of a sudden a sheep comes out, and the scene cuts, and I'm like, and I didn't understand why the sheep thing was so funny and i remember asking my dad like i don't understand why there's sheeps well why is there a sheep there like just brought out into the shower and he wouldn't he's like he's like it's just it's just funny but he wouldn't tell me why it was funny and it wasn't until like i was in college that i hadn't watched revenge of the nerds in years and i'm watching it and i had forgotten about that sheep scene right and it comes out and i'm like Holy fuck! They're supposed to fuck the sheep, and I fucking started laughing my ass off <laughs> because around all you going the like, memories. Why are you laughing so hard? <laughs> all the memories started coming back of me not understanding it, my dad not telling me why it was so fucking funny, like all that stuff like came rushing back, 
So <laughs> that's awesome. So th- that was a so weird. How, that was a weird period yeah. of time because I I remember Tom Hanks was up and coming. He did Splash, and then he did uh, Bachelor Party, and Bachelor Party and Big too was later on. Yeah, Bachelor Party. They did it with the you know they were that girl was gonna do whatever with that donkey, but you never got to see that because the party gets you know the police come and all that stuff. But then many years later, Kevin Smith did what he felt like, but of course altered it to have a guy in a donkey and actually went through with it. Yeah. Which actually made a bunch of critics like, I guess leave the, no one critic like left the theater because he was appalled or whatever by it. But I thought it was hysterical. I was like, wow. Like for those people that watch bachelor party always wondered, you know, Oh man, they never got to do that. And then he, he went, he went for it, man. And clerks too. It was too funny. But, um, yeah. I think we'll be the only people, the only podcast out there that will ever link Blade Runner, Empire Strikes Back, and Revenge of the Nerds <laughs> together. <laughs> they, they each have a donkey in it or a sheep? I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I think the last one on my list I didn't talk about was Wrath of Khan, but I don't really need to talk too much about that other than I just remember that the impact, I mean, I was already... I, I loved watching Star Trek with my mom. She loved, you know, she showed me the 60s Star Trek when I was a kid. And then I watched the the Star Trek motion picture, which now if you watch it, it's like watching molasses. It's like watching paint dry. It's so boring. Um, but Wrath of Khan was like the first Star Trek movie that I can remember that just, again, like it had everything, you know, in that movie, just everything and, and so much emotion and, you know, and, so much stuff going on and it linked, you know, the original series episode of Khan with the movie and it was just brilliant, brilliantly done. And you can go back and watch that movie now and you're still like, this, this is awesome. Especially the ending, you know, when Spock spoilers, you know, Spock dies and, uh, it's not spoilers. I know it's it's, 20 fucking years. (laughs) Well, I mean, those people that watch Star Trek in the darkness and they're like, Oh, like Kirk died, whatever that is so poorly done compared to, Wrath of Khan. I mean, it it hits you in the gut when Spock dies, and and he when he says you were forever be you know my friend or whatever, and and he live long and prosper puts it on the glass, you know, and Shatner yells Khan, you know that. I mean, it's funny now when you kind of watch him go Khan, and the camera goes up in the air <laughs> because the can because so many people have mimicked that where the camera goes up in the air and he's yelling at the, yelling up the ceiling and all that. Um, so that was it. That movie had a pretty impact on me as well. And I, I kind of wanted to get into, did we go over everything on your list? Did you go over every single movie? Um, just about, um, yeah, I think you went through we, everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I just can't like, and, and the movies that are on this list influence what we're doing now too. Absolutely. I, mean, I can't hate Michael Bay anymore than giving you the reason because Transformers the movie made my top 10 of our first like top 10 nostalgic type list like Transformers the movie made my first top 10 list yeah and and the shit that Michael Bay has been putting out there is just garbage um and just is just terrible I mean just awful I we we're, we'll have to do like a Michael Bay I hate you podcast soon. <laughs> that could that could go for a few. Yeah, we could do that. We'll just we'll just do like a Transformers I hate you like like a G one just Michael Bay sucks. Yeah, that podcast. would be because I mean like growing up like <clears throat> I mean how many times has Optimus Prime died in in the movies right now? Oh like God! Twice? Yeah, a few times, and or develop powers, and then like got rid of. It's them. fucked up every single time. Yeah, right? every single time they mess this character up. I mean, they had, there was glimpses of coolness, but not that everything else overshadowed it. Um, and that guy, the guy Peter Cullen, who voices Optimus Prime, probably doesn't have a lot of years left. And what's going to end up happening is that you know, five, six, seven, ten years from now, people get tired of these stupid Transformers movies. Finally. Like, they'll wake up, like, people who follow the Kardashians will fucking wake up and be like, why am I following these paperweights? <laughs> and then, like, they'll just fucking grow up and realize that these movies are fucking stupid. Yeah. And by that time, the original voice of Optimus Prime hopefully is still alive, but he might not be because he's really old already. Yeah, his... And then all, the, all his voice talent is wasted on Michael Bay's fucking shit movies. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that does stink. I mean, it it is a travesty because the one bright spot 
of the Transformers series is when they announced that they got the original guy to voice Optimus Prime. That was the only thing that really got me excited about that movie. And, yeah, and, they've, and they completely uh, wasted him. Um, but... I mean, this is the same director who... He put balls on Devastator. Uh, like, he's an asshole. Masturbation, masturbation jokes. Uh, Shia LaBeouf. If, do I have to... I can keep going on and on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, so I do before we sign off. I mean, I have I do have some things, uh, some outliers, some uh, like a list of just a very short list of movies that were also influential to me, <coughs> but they didn't make the cut, the top ten. Okay, Batman is in that. I did have Batman in. Oh, there. nice. Okay, Princess Bride. Um, nice. Big Trouble, Little China. Uh, Labyrinth. Um, Dark Crystal, Die Hard, and uh, Aliens. You mean Aliens? Aliens, yeah. Yeah, okay. Actually, that's kind of funny. Okay, so I have outliers too that I had to remove. Uh, I, I got from 300 movies down to 20, down to 10, or something <laughs> like that. That's brutal. <laughs> yeah, so I have the Terminator in my outliers. Spaceballs, oh, Revenge of the Nerds, good one. Revenge of the Nerds, uh, The Monster Squad, Real Genius, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and A Christmas Story and Aliens. Oh, that's awesome! Real Genius, what a pull! I, I love that film. That movie's so funny. I like Top Secret too with Val Kilmer. Um, those I don't are really. I think I've actually ever seen that all the way through. Oh. I just love Real Genius. I, I love Real Genius. Everything about that movie is is great to me. It like, is. It's such a. It, um, it's it's a really good. It's a it's a fun movie from beginning to end. Um, it's just a did few. you did you think about the Monster Squad at all? I did, but um, I that one didn't impact me as much. I think as it did you. I think I was again. A lot of this has to do with age. Um. I sound like I'm like 20 years older than you, but still it's like, it does <laughs> sometimes four or five years. There's a factor there. There's something that gets yeah. missing and monster squad for me. I mean, I, I love that movie when it came out on DVD, I was overjoyed. And then I heard recently the rumor mill of that they're going to reboot that. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but cause you know, they'll just do stupid shit in it. You know, so I'm hoping whoever gets a hold of it, like these Duffer brothers or whatever those guys name that did Stranger Things, give them more shit to do, man. They got it down like they know the 80s. I, I would love to see them do pull any kind of 80s movie, obviously not Ghostbusters and a few others, but like pull something and like redo and reboot it or do it. Monster Squad would be one of those I, I could see. Um, but Things like, you know, I know they've talked a lot about, please make another Back to the Future. I'm like, you you can't. You know, you, you can't do that. I mean, you can make another time travel type movie and call it something else, but you cannot do Back to the Future. Um, like, I don't think they really should have attempted Ghostbusters. That's just me, but... Um, I mean, I, I love Ghostbusters. I don't think it's a near perfect movie. I think Back to the Future probably is a near perfect movie. Yeah. From beginning to end. Yeah. Um, um I mean, even like even the the Star Wars movies, they're not near perfect movies. They're they're awesome movies, but near perfection, like from beginning to end, about everything that's happening in the movie. There's no real plot holes. There's really no. Mm -hmm. There's no. There's plenty of character development. You know everybody's you know motivation, everything that's going on. I mean, Back to the Future is pretty much a near perfect movie. Yeah. Um, uh, probably the most one of the more perfect movies that I've ever seen that I can think about that has influenced me the way uh, about anything. I mean, like time travel, uh, adventure, fa like a little bit of fantasy in there about you know time traveling and, and the DeLorean, all that stuff, science fiction. I, I mean, that movie has everything. I have a really hard time now at my old age. Like wh now, I look back and go wonder why they did two and three because. The first one, it, it's a standalone. It could be a standalone movie. I mean, the way it ended, I honestly thought when I walked out of that theater that 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 was it. And then like, because it took like four years. Like there was no internet back then. Or there wasn't anyone saying like, oh, we're gonna make a sequel in a couple of years. Like it, and it didn't have. I don't remember it saying to be continued in the theater. I don't remember it saying that. I think that's something that might have added later. 
But so when the movie ended, sure. so when the movie ended, I was like, oh, it ended like cool. And then like three or four years later, we're on the Universal Studios lot tour, you know, and the tram goes by the the clock tower, the or the center and back to, in um, oh god, I can't even remember what the name of the the town is now. But they drove us through there, and I was like, why does it look like this? Because they, they used to drive you through there it's and say, this is the Back to the Future set, you know, with the clock tower. and the and Hill Valley, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Hill Valley, the square and all that. And so we're driving through it again, and I'm like, this isn't Hill Valley anymore. Oh, crud, they must be, like, filming another movie. And the guy's like, we're now we're in post-production on Back to the Future 2. And I was like, what? Like, I freaked out. And then the guy kept talking and said they had enough film to do a third movie, so there's going to be two back to back, which I think in the history of cinema hasn't been done very many times. Like I remember Superman one and two was back to back. I remember Back to the Future two and three was back to back. The Matrix. Yeah, but Superman one and two, Superman one and two was one big the, film actually. Yeah, and then they cut it to make Superman two, and Donner wasn't brought back because he didn't like. No, he didn't the, like the Donner cut's did. pretty good. The Donner cut's pretty cool actually some of the stuff is kind of weird there's a there's a scene where <coughs> superman jumps out of the or lois lane jumps out of the daily planet i think instead of yeah the, they changed the, it to the niagara of falls the, uh, yeah instead of that scene and the niagara falls works better i think yeah i do too um i do but, too <laughs> yeah um yeah unfortunately none of the superman movies made my list because they were kind of done before actually they were on superman 2 i think is on my was was one of the 300 movies did that I hit down here. did that hit 1980 did that movie come out in the 80s it was like yeah barely yeah, barely i guess superman 1 didn't yeah yeah because yeah, superman 1 uh, that was influential to me I, I saw that movie in the 70s in the theater as well and back then what they did was they had intermission like you would get if the movie was like two hours long or something because they did that with Empire Strikes Back also. I was in the theater watching. Really? Yeah, yeah. At the Empire where they cut it, they cut it right where it says um, Yoda says there's another as Luke is flying off in the X-wing and they cut it right there and you and you got to go to the bathroom and get something to drink, come back and then they'll flack the they'd flash the lights saying like get your ass back to your seat. And then the movie started oh, started awesome. up again. Yeah, and in Superman, it was the same thing. Like Superman, I think it was right where he was saving that plane from crashing. Like they stopped it right there. You got to go, you know, and then come back and watch it. So they used to do that for long movies. Shit, why they why did they do that when watching Return of the King? That movie was three and a half hours long. I had to pee so freaking bad that I didn't want to miss. <laughs> I didn't want to miss one second of that movie. You know, I wish they did that in Batman v Superman. I would have got drunk and then came back. <laughs> I would have drove home. <laughs> <laughs> I would have drove home, got my iPad, and started watching Civil War uh, somewhere. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so your so your outside list is kind of comparable to mine. You had some similarities and some differences, but yeah, I mean, I even had Raiders out there, but you know, I, I you know, I love I love Indiana Jones. The there's only three Indiana Jones. Let's get that straight. Right, and, and uh, I I just love. I, what I love about Indiana Jones is again that that overarching theme of my list is is adventure. Yes. And if if The Goonies is adventure for like kids, like trying to discover you know maps and solve puzzles and shit like that, I mean they owe their puzzle solving pirate adventure to Indiana Jones. I think absolutely because you know, that was like for me anyway. For me, that was the first time I'd ever seen. You know, okay, I, I got to solve this puzzle that leads to another thing. I mean, th- I mean, uh, uh, like I'm playing Uncharted Four right now, and that owes so oh, much yeah. to Indiana Jones. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Um, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I love Uncharted because I get to be basically Indiana Jones. You know, Nathan Drake is is Indiana Jones, just in different name, and you know, in a video game. Why so, didn't t- you know, you just hit something there. Why, why doesn't naughty dog contact Lucasfilm and say like, let me borrow Indiana Jones and, and make a game because it would be awesome. I mean, obviously you wouldn't be running and jumping and climbing walls and shit, but you would be, you know, using your whip and swinging across and doing all kinds of cool stuff. You know, it'd be a pretty cool thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think naughty dog has done a really great job with uncharted four or uncharted the whole series. But again, they're, 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 you can't not be influenced by Indiana Jones when you make a an adventure game about solving puzzles and you know getting the treasure relics and yeah absolutely yeah those games are fantastic I bought the PlayStation Four last year and got the the Uncharted 
version where all three games are on there. And I haven't played the fourth one yet. I'm dying to though. I'm, I, you got to tell me whether you like it or not. It sounds like you do. So um, far, it's awesome. It's um, definitely the best in the series. Dude, what, what did you did you see Princess Bride in the theater or no? Did that come no, that come a lot man, later. I did not go to the movies a lot growing up. Okay, and I remember again saw Princess Bride on VHS tape, and it it's in my it's in my three hundred list. Um, but it just it it didn't make so it's a top ten. So to talk me. about like we always talk about diversity and stuff, and so like they I mean the Asian culture wasn't treated very well in the 80s either like they're always like villains and you know shit like that so like you know they weren't really represented that well in big trouble little china either like that was a a kurt russell movie although his um i think his his partner his partner was his best friend yeah his best friend was was, was, yeah that's right i just remembered that um but i mean the goonies was pretty diverse although they didn't have any black people in it no but they had um uh data but who was also yeah. he was an Indian in Temple of Doom, right? He played uh, yep, he was Short Temple Round. Doom. Yeah. Yep. Um, let's see. Karate Kid had Miyagi. They had that one black dude that was in the Cobra Kai's that was also in Revenge of the Nerds. Um, <laughs> he didn't do anything in Karate Kid. <laughs> yeah, he did. He got his butt kicked. By Bobby. He's in Cobra Kai. He got his ass kicked. Sweep the leg. How many times uh, have you ever see Sweep the Leg? Uh uh, I just saw that the other day. I love that movie. It's so good. It's it's so good. Um, and then they ruined it with two and three. <laughs> uh, I didn't mind two. You I didn't saw mind that two? in the theater. I, that was okay. I, I was saw okay. two in the theater. The third. Um, the third. One's I, I just remember. I remember him like. I just remember the fact that like oh he there's an his love his love interest is like an Asian girl. I was like that's different. I've never seen that before. Yeah, that was kind of cool. <clears throat> After his other girlfriend wrecked his car, and then broke up with him like the next day. <laughs> I was like, yeah, "What?" <laughs> she, w- she went out with a football player instead. I was like, "Dude, you just like beat everyone up, and won the tournament, and then she bailed on you. What a bitch!" <laughs> <laughs> and wrecked your car. Yeah, and, yeah. It's add insult to injury. You're not gonna pay for it. Like, come on. The beginning of that movie doesn't really make any sense because, like, he comes and he's dressed in a full tux, right? Yeah. So apparently. In a really ugly blue tux, by it was the way. Prom, right? And prom or something. And I'm like thinking, like, did she like fucking break up with you on prom night and <laughs> <laughs> and have sex with a football player? I think they were trying after to... or before fucking your car up. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I don't know, man. She tried to go on a on a joy. Because it was the next. It was the next. It wasn't at night, you know. It was in the morning. So I'm like. Would she just like not go to your like room that every high school guy got? Like, and go to your room and just decided to joyride in your car and <laughs> yeah, fuck exactly. the football player? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that'd be so bad. I'm like, it just goes to show it doesn't matter if you win a fucking trophy or not, you're still a loser. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's like oh, so what you did a crane kick into the guy's face like my boyfriend like won the state championship of football games so. yeah <laughs> that's it doesn't matter that's messed up man <laughs> yeah and he dated like Elizabeth Shue before she got like really hot too oh I know Adventures in Babysitting I actually just watched that the other day <laughs> I'm yeah, not joking TV. it's on Netflix yeah. I was like oh I remember this movie. Yeah, she she got. I remember seeing her years later. I was like, "Wait a minute, she got hot." <laughs> like, uh, if you ever get a chance, watch uh, Leaving Las Vegas. She plays like a prostitute with Nicolas Cage, and uh, that's a really yeah, really I've good. I've never seen that movie. Yeah, she's super super. I remember good. her. Where did what, what other movie was she in that was she, like? I remember seeing her. I was like, "Whoa, Elizabeth." She, she was really in hot. Uh, cocktail. cocktail with cocktail. Tom Cruise. Yeah, I think that was the movie that made me think, like, "Oh my god." That's the Karate Kid chick. Yeah, that's too funny. And then she was in Back to the Future 2 and 3 because the original Jennifer, like, I think she had to take care of her mom was really ill, so she couldn't, she decided not to be in the movie. Um, Yeah, yeah. Because I remember watching Back to the Future 2 going, wait a minute, that doesn't look like Jennifer. And, like, you know, you you pointed out the Marty McFly thing, but I didn't didn't even put two and two together. I was just like, oh, I guess he's not in it that much, you know? (laughs) But as we knew by listening to Jeffrey Wiseman, that was way off. Um, yeah, Princess Bride to me was like that was pretty influential. Um, 
I just showed that to my son recently. He totally dug it. I mean, he had no idea what that movie was about until I showed it to him. It's such a good movie. I mean, that that, that movie's so good. That, that that's another like non a, a pretty flawless movie. Um, and of course, I mean, we anyone anyone that's watched that movie quotes in Nigo Montoya. You know, um, yeah. That that's such an iconic um, scene. You know, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. It was just fantastic. And he says it over and over again. It's and you're just like, and the music's going, and you're just like you're standing up, going like, oh, kill that son of a bitch. You know, and oh, so good. Um, I think you had aliens under outliers. Too, I right? did, dude. Out. You know, that's that was a tough one for me because aliens again. I was I think it was like 13, 14 when I watched that. I didn't watch a lot of rated R's because I was kind of scaredy cat. And I just remember that movie kicking so much ass. I just remember at the end of that movie cheering, like when she goes, get away from her, you bitch. And she's in that yeah. machine. I jumped out of my seat, you know, and people were like, sit down, shut up. And it was, I mean, that was an iconic moment. Um, That's one also the very few sequels that actually trumps the, the original, I think, anyway. Yeah, you know? Jimmy Cameron, and, man. And because, <clears throat> yeah, because... I mean, it wasn't the same director, but it was like, you know, in the first one, it was only one alien right. against, like, basically, like, a scavenging crew, you know? Like, so they didn't have any military experience or anything like that, and I was like, okay, cool, Aliens is about the military. They've got guns, you know, they hadn't, they know how to defend, they know how to fight and all this shit, and it did not fucking matter. It did not matter right. one bit. So, like, that's what I loved about that movie, too, that it didn't matter that they had weapons or anything like Look, that. They were just... Aliens, it just, to me, did what Suicide Squad couldn't do, and that's you cared about almost every single one of those characters, and you felt each one of their deaths. Like, you, even, like, Corporal Hicks, who was just, like, you know, a total whiny bitch, and then he goes out shooting like you want this you want this like he improv a lot of that stuff bill paxton did and it was just so fucking good and when he died you're like no like like all you cared about that character then like paul riser you know played the bad guy and you're like when he got caught and killed you're like yes you know like you were just so invested in every single one of those characters like the chick you know the the beefed up chick who was just like badass like even more badass than the vasquez. guys were vasquez yeah you know <clears throat> and um and some of the other characters, you know, and of course Michael Bean and all that stuff, and um, and Newt is one of my favorite, you know, kid performances of, of all time. I'm, I know I've heard that before from Kevin Smith as well, but like the, I really believe that too. Like you believe that character, and you believe that motivation for Ripley to go back and get that and and save her, even more so when you watch the special editions because it shows her seeing her daughter yeah, the old. Director's cut. Yeah, I mean, really emotional stuff that makes a lot of sense why she went back for Newt. And then they fucked it all up in Aliens 3, which really irritating because, like, you wanted to see Newt and you wanted to see, you know, Michael Bean's character again and all that. Um, which, it's, almost like, it's almost like Brett Ratner directed Aliens 3. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Like, because, like, he did, he did X-Men 3 and, like, kind of took the franchise and just shit all over it. Oh my gosh! I, I mean, mean, I knew he was behind the. I knew he was behind the eight ball when when he had to make that movie, but but again, it's it's Brett Ratner. <laughs> Dude, you fumbled the Dark Phoenix saga. You fumbled. You know, I don't know that. Yeah, we can go on and on about that movie for sure. Um, La Labyrinth. But, and it, Labyrinth was an influential. Oh, Dark Crystal. You know, those those were yeah, Labyrinth. Really, really, and Die Hard. You know, again, that that movie, Die, Die Hard, to me, and like Lethal Weapon. I, I, I had Lethal Weapon on the outside too, um, but Die Hard, yeah, and, Die Hard, and Lethal Weapon are both two films that did the the buddy action comedy, uh, buddy action thriller type movie, and then Die Hard was like the you know one man against everybody, and and like they started those genres. Um, Count I mean, Die Hard is the essential, like, original video game, basically. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, Bruce Lee, I mean, they have Enter the Dragon. You have the Bruce Lee going up the, you know, trying to fight all the bad guys level by level and all that stuff. But they, Die Hard kind of took it a little bit further and, and did something well, really game unique. Game of Death, actually. Game of Death, Game of Death, right, sorry. Um, sorry, Bruce Lee. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, God, we can go on and on, but, but the top ten, like, 
definitely are the most influential for me for the 80s. I mean, definitely I can look very fondly on those movies. I can put them in at any time and watch them and love them for what they are. And and I, I look forward to keep showing those to my son as he gets older. I keep pulling more and more and more out. And then I get really nostalgic. and Show him... Um, Show him Revenge of the Nerds now and see if he gets it. <laughs> Dad, what's up with the sheep? And I'm like, hey, you'll, I'll, you'll find out in college, buddy. <laughs> you just tell you just just tell him flat out. Tell him do do what my dad didn't do, and just tell him and see the look on his face. No, I'll just tell him like go go, go talk to Uncle Vic. He'll tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll fucking tell him. I'll give him the graphic details. I'll make you, reg- I'll I'll draw, make you regret. I'll draw. I'll pictures. make you regret making me do your job. <laughs> You're like I'll buy a, I'll buy a inflatable sheep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, it's, uh, we'll end on that note. But uh, yeah. <laughs> what yeah, a- we'll 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 end on me telling your son about fucking sheep. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <clears throat> control control alt delete control alt delete. Uh, <laughs> All right, man. Well. That was episode 41 of Chew on This and Nerds United Podcast. I'm BJ. Vic. Chew on that. Till next time, folks. Later. <laughs>